It's our pleasure to welcome Gary Kelly again to the Wings Club. This is always a December to remember for us, and we're so happy to have you. Uh, Gary needs no introduction, but serves as chairman of the board, president and CEO of Southwest. Uh, Southwest is celebrating 39 years of consecutive profitability and named number one in customer satisfaction by the Department of Transportation for 2011. Gary is a 26-year veteran of Southwest. He began his career there as controller, moving up to C CFO and then CEO in 2004. Among many accomplishments, Gary chairs the McCombs School Advisory Council at the University of Texas. He is vice chairman of Airlines for America and was named to the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. And it is a great pleasure to invite Gary Kelly to the stage. Figure out how to walk around. I'll walk this one. And now, to introduce for today's interview session, I'd like to have Howard Rubel come up and join us. Howard is managing director of Jeffries and Company. He leads the Aerospace and Defense Equity Research Group, and he's been following uh, aerospace and defense-related companies for a very long time. He's been a Wings Club member from 2004, and it is great to have Howard here as our interviewer. Thanks, Howard. Thank you very much. And, Thanks, Gary. And with that, I'm going to turn the show over to you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you all. A year ago, Gary was here, and I figured the right way to talk about this is to talk at least a little bit about stocks for a moment. And a year ago, the stock closed at $8. And 42 cents. That was Southwest stock price. And last night's close was a little over $10 at $10 and two cents. And so that's a 19% return. And the stock market in the same period of time was up only 17%. So you know, if you keep on coming back, you'll continue to deliver some good shareholder returns. So we hope um, you do come back. And I'll be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, we're done on that. <laughs> so. Um, now, I, I think there's kind of four topics I'd like to cover. One would be the economic backdrop and, and what you see. Uh, a second would be how you think about the Southwest brand. The third is we're going to ask a couple of equipment decisions because, you know, airline, uh, aerospace analysts always want to find out about how the product's performing. And then maybe there's time for a fun question or two, Gary. So first, let's talk about the U.S. economy. And Southwest is a very important part of it. Um, what do you see? for U.S. traffic um, for 2013? Well, we've got a pretty good uh, view, I think, into the economy. We, we carry, uh, of the traffic in the United States, one in four uh, travelers is on Southwest Airlines. And of course, uh, uh, we're known for low fares, uh, and uh, hopefully we're offering a, a really good value there. But uh, the visibility into the future isn't very far, and uh, we have to make a lot of guesses when it comes to uh, you know, an outlook for 2013. But but I'm pretty optimistic. We've seen uh, some pretty decent trends uh, in 2012, uh, a little bit of inconsistency. I think for the, the third year in a row in 2012, we saw some softness in the summertime, which seemed to uh, be reflected in the broader economy. Uh, typically, uh, airline revenues will correlate pretty closely with GDP uh, and perhaps outperform it by a point or two. So at least based on all the forecasts next year, that gives us uh, you know, some, some reason to be uh, optimistic. We're, I think the word for us still, though, is cautious. We had a soft September, uh, and I'm not sure that we can fully explain that still. And it wasn't just Southwest. It was the broader uh, airline industry. That was followed up by a very strong October. And it looks like we're going to have a, a good uh, holiday season here in December. We had a strong Thanksgiving. So uh, the signs that we see so far uh, look like a pretty, uh, pretty decent outlook for next year. And, uh, uh, revenues uh, still need to grow for the industry. We're still dealing with record high uh, energy cost, uh, so clearly there's uh, pressure there to produce. But um, I'm not sure that we'll see any traffic growth. You look at the traffic in the U.S. since 2000, and it has barely changed. It is up about 2%, uh, whereas the uh, U.S. economy has grown over 20% in that time period. So. Traffic is being affected by higher cost, higher energy costs in particular, uh, and I think you're going to continue to see that trend next year. So is there something, though, that you could do or the industry could do to 
bring people back. I mean, to your point is we have noticed that uh, the consumer dollar isn't being spent on the same way on travel as it used to. It's, it's probably less than maybe GDP or um, so are there things that the airline industry can do to make, make the flying experience better? Well, you know, Howard, I think the consumer is uh, the, the desire and the, uh, the, the, the demand for consumer travel is there and it's strong at the right price. I think what's really changed, uh, and especially over the last decade, is business travel, and especially business travel in short-haul markets. The growth has been uh, within the domestic U.S. industry. It's in longer haul. So I do think you're seeing business travel in that area, uh, but also uh, consumer travel. I think it's all about price for the most part, uh, and I think at the end of the day that will drive both segments of the market. So the, to the extent that we as an industry can keep costs down uh, and allow the economy to grow, I do think that we'll see an increase in traffic over time. You touch, you know, if you said one in four travelers every day, what do you think the consumer wants that, that maybe you're not providing that could be kind of interesting or exciting again to get more people on board um, an aircraft or to think about a, an extra trip? Well, the number one criteria, uh, if it's sort of tied for first, is uh, you need to go where I want to go, so you've got to have the schedule, and number two, it needs to be at the right price. And that just comes back over and over. Uh, right up there with it is service. I just want to be treated right. And um, there's a number of ways that, that we or our, our competitors can approach that. But I think that's uh, pretty straightforward. That's what, uh, that's what people are looking for when they travel. Um, what we don't want to do is to cause people to decide that they don't want to travel. I really so that, that has, that again, at the right price, more people are gonna travel, and of course we proved that many times over four decades. And I, I mean, that sort of sets me up for a question I was gonna ask a little later, but I think we need to ask it now. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a cartoon character called Pogo, and I, I guess he's identified us as, uh, he says something like, you know, we've identified the enemy and he's us. And if we look at TSA, I think the TSA budget is larger than the profitability of the U.S. airline industry. So how does the industry, you know, change that dynamic a bit so that some of this um, dollars that we're spending on, on waiting in line and searching people, in fact, go to make the travel experience better, simpler, and in fact, would help your short-haul traffic? Well, obviously, the TSA has a mission that's important and, uh, uh, and, and is as U.S. citizens, we all need to support that. It needs to be, uh, and there needs to be a customer service focus, and there needs to be a focus on efficiency. Um, I think it's pretty remarkable what that agency has done um, in a short time after 9-11, on the one hand, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there, there can't be some improvement. So we just need to continue to work with them as an industry on, on suggestions, on staffing, uh, having adequate resources at peak times, but in off peak times, not having a full staffing there and, and things like that. In terms of the actual uh, processes and procedures that they use, that's evolving. I do think that the TSA leadership is focused on improving that as well, and uh, obviously we're very supportive of that. At the end of the day, though, you know, you hear about the hassle factor. And uh, while I do think that that is an input to what's happened to traffic over a long period of time, my opinion is that the driving factor is cost and therefore the price to the customer. Because you can overcome a lot of hassle factor for the right price to get somebody from A to B. Talking also a little bit more about service, um, one of the things that also has happened is probably everybody in this room today is carrying a, an electronic device with them. And, you know, and, and, and one of the things that happens is sometimes we will do a conference call instead of go travel, or we will right. send a picture. And so, you know, have you thought about some form of way of don't text but travel? And and so, how how do you um, you know take advantage of maybe some of these electronic devices and either in terms of interfacing with the customer or encouraging him to uh, book something at the last minute because it's more fun to to be there than it is to just hold a warm device in your hand. Well, I think that's, that's another input. You know, I think as time has gone by, uh, the internet, I guess, was introduced commercially probably 1995, 96, something like that, and a lot's changed uh, in that time period. Lots changed in this decade, uh, just with uh, what, what, a, what a phone can do. Uh, so, 
I think making the travel experience uh, less of a hassle and enabling the use of those devices, which is at least where uh, many in the industry are headed, I think will help there. Uh, and I do think a messaging about um, being in there in person uh, as opposed to just doing business uh, electronically it, it is an idea. We, we've done that to some degree and with results that were not necessarily all that, that great. But uh, uh, again, I think price is the, is the big motivator and uh, again, certainly that's, that's what Southwest was founded on. You've seen um, price stimulate loads and industry load factors over the years have gone from the 60s to the 80s. I mean, is there a practical limit? Obviously, 100% is about as good as you can get in terms of filling your flights. But how do you think about managing the infrastructure at Southwest? And how do you think about maybe the industry overall? I mean, where is, where is it too full? And, you know, my, some of my friends in the airline, airplane manufacturing world will come to you and say, you need a couple more, more airplanes. So where does that sort of fit in this? Process. Well, we're in new territory. In the old days when I started, uh, we, our rule of thumb was if we hit a 65% load factor, we are full. And what that meant in a short haul high frequency model is that during the peak times of the day, uh, we were full, 8 a.m., 5 p.m. During the off peak times of the day, we were less than full, but when you were paying 40 cents per gallon for jet fuel, uh, the, the marginal load factor that you needed during, during that time of the day you didn't have to be full. Well, now we have seen a significant decline in those short haul high frequency markets across the US, not Southwest, the industry. And it is very much more oriented towards long haul flights uh, where you can't afford to have a long haul flight with a 65% load factor. Uh, you know, you'll go out of business. So Southwest load factor has gone up 10 percentage points over the last five years. So it really is new territory for us. In 2007, I think we had a 70% load factor. And here we are in the 80s, uh, just like everybody else. So it has, um, uh, and we've had to adjust. We have more connecting customers today in order to drive those load factors. We've had to trim um, unpopular, unprofitable flights, and especially early morning, late evening. And uh, the, you know, the, the result is uh, people are now flying in, in a tighter time period during the day. Uh, but it's more efficient, uh, certainly for the airline, and hopefully we can pass on those cost savings. Do you ever try to, you know, because there's a bit more time the passenger spends in the airport today, you know, either going through TSA or other, are there other sort of revenue opportunities you might be able to see in terms of capturing that consumer's attention during that period of time so that it would help your business and offsets? You know, you're talking about price. Well, you know, we've all figured out ways of, you know, attaching additional fees to whatever they're doing is there, or catching people's attention. Are there things that you can do there? I, I think so. Um, and again, it's a different world for us. Uh, in the old days, every customer flew on us for an hour. And now, of course, we've got Transcon and, and uh, we'll be expanding beyond uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, mainland uh, with San Juan flights uh, next year. So We've got bigger airplanes for longer flights. We've got much longer uh, stage lengths today than we did uh, 10 and 20 years ago. So we do have customers that are spending more time with us and more time at the airports. We've invested a lot in our airports uh, over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, we may want to continue to do that as, as the nature of our customers' uh, journey uh, changes. Uh, the thing I love about Southwest is we, we try to serve all of our constituents, and they're not mutually exclusive. So we try to take great care of our people. We try to take great care of all of our financial stakeholders. But in the end, if you don't meet your customers' needs and make them want to come to you, you can't take care of your other constituents. So we always try to filter things through uh, what can we do to enhance the, the customer experience at Southwest, and I think clearly that's something we'll want to look at. You talk about international, and before I go there, I want to talk about sort of maybe um, your fleet um, a, a bit. And you've started to add the Dash 800s to your fleet, and you still have a tremendous number of 700s. And, um, and so there's two kind of questions. One is, do you see routes where you might actually need like a, a Dash 900 because of the density just being there? And, and I mean, clearly, if you have the right international uh, routes, maybe the right answer is two sorts of first class solutions for um, flying um, on an international um, route? 
that's part of our transformation, is really uh, modernizing our fleet and adding the 800. That is a material change for us, uh, and one that we'll want to work through um, carefully in a measured way. So far, uh, our, our experience with the 800 has been phenomenal. Uh, if we take that as a subfleet, uh, and we have 34-800s today, uh, it has the highest load factor in our system. Uh, so we, we feel like we know how to schedule it, uh, we feel we know how to turn it, uh, and uh, uh, we feel like we know which markets uh, that it performs well in. We have some physical constraints at certain airports that work against a bigger airplane, so we have to factor all of those kinds of things in. Uh, I think it's very premature to move now uh, beyond the, the Dash 800. At some point, I think it would be very logical to see if there is a need for more subfleets. Uh, but uh, uh, we're busy with what we've got right now. And I think that we're, we're, we're firmly committed to 78 800s. Um, and soon we'll need to decide whether we want to go beyond that or begin to take uh, deliveries, uh, you know, with the uh, Dash 7 again. Well, you know, one of the trends that seems to have happened is, you know, upgaging in the market and, you know, just a little bit tongue-in-cheek. So if you continue to have all this upgaging that goes on, you know, have you thought about maybe, you know, sitting next to Barry and that he pitched the A380 as an opportunity, you know, to go from, from Dallas to... That's um, a big one, so... <laughs> No, I'm just having a little fun with you for a moment. That would be the ultimate in upgaging, I guess. And, but then it would just be four engines, and that would be it on one flight a day, and you'd be done. So not everybody would be happy with that. But I don't know if we can turn that in 20 minutes, though. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, talk, let's stay with um, equipment for a moment. About a year ago, you um, made a big decision and decided to buy the uh, 737 MAX. Could you... Tell us what sort of insight you have in the development cycle a year later and how you feel about the decision and, you know, what do you see? Well, of course, you know, we're uh, obviously guided by what our, our supplier partners are telling us. But, um, yeah, we're very encouraged uh, with the, uh, all the technology that, and, and the uh, timelines and um, looking forward to having that airplane in 2017. I think everyone is very enthused that it's going to meet or beat you know, the, uh, the initial expectations, and obviously that's very encouraging for us. That, it was a financial decision. Uh, we wanted to take advantage of uh, new engine technology that was uh, uh, about to uh, uh, be born, that's uh, been under development for decades. We need, we need the efficiency from a fuel uh, perspective. Uh, I think all of us are concerned with where fuel prices are headed from here, and we're at all-time record levels. You know, there's with Brent crude at $109 a barrel this morning, and you know we were we were laughing earlier about uh, oh my goodness we're out of business at $100 a barrel. We had an all-time record second quarter uh, this year uh, with $109 Brent. So the industry is adjusting, uh, but we can't stop here. So we wanted to take advantage of that, and then we thought that that uh, you know that decision made made good sense for us. I, I want to talk one more thing on regulation, and maybe go to costs, and then uh, you know FAA. Um, you know, as in charge of slots and, you know, and as you sort of think about how you want to run the business and how you think about efficient air routes. So there's things that you have with the dialogue, you know, maybe as um, what incoming president of um, A4A that you sit down and, and say, here's some technology we can use or here's some things you could change in procedures to help us become more efficient. And could you talk about that dialogue? Yes, and of course, the, w w on this point, uh, the A4A agenda and Southwest agenda are, are perfectly aligned. Um, one, of, one of the high priorities is the modernization of the uh, air traffic control system, something that we've talked about at this luncheon uh, every year that, uh, that we've been here. Um, we've made significant investments uh, in the cockpits uh, and are not, uh, are not guiding the aircraft uh, with RMP, RNAV procedures. And so uh, those we, we've got to pursue those uh, opportunities much more aggressively, uh, certainly before we invest any more money uh, in any more uh, technology. I think we're very open to continuing to support modernizing the air traffic control system. We just need to take advantage of what we've already invested in. To talk about 
your international market for a moment and your international opportunities. Airtran was a big step. It opened up. It was about a dozen markets or so, I think, for yeah. you. How's that gone? And 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 what do you see in terms of opportunities? You know, it's it's gone so well, and it is a, a big undertaking. I don't think it's the kind of thing that a a company or an airline ought to do every year. Uh, and for us, we are so different at Southwest Airlines. We have a different product, we have different technology, uh, and it, we are in the midst of transforming ourselves, and in some ways to be more industry standard uh, with some of, these, uh, uh, some of these processes. So part of the integration is just that, getting Southwest Airlines ready to fly international, take international bookings. Uh, that's just not something that we can do today. Uh, so considering that, there's probably uh, seven major things uh, that have to be decided with uh, an acquisition like that. You've got to decide on the brand. Uh, you, you've got to decide where you're going to fly with the network. Uh, you've got to decide what to do with the fleet because AirTran comes with, uh, uh, as we know, the Boeing 717. Um, we've got all those things done. We have uh, la labor agreements, of course, are a major uh, uh, item to be, to be dealt with uh, and a merger, and all of our integration agreements are in place uh, with our labor. Uh, so we've got, we know what we want to do with the network, we know what we want to do with the brand. Uh, we've got a physical conversion process underway with the airplanes and the airports. Um, so the long pole in the tent is the technology, and it is primarily just bringing Southwest Airlines reservation system technology, uh, to be blunt, up to the 21st century. So uh, that work is well underway. The first phase of that will come in 2014 with international capabilities, and then we'll follow on uh, after that with a full replacement of our reservation system. But just as an example, uh, Southwest did not have the capability to manage multiple aircraft types before now, and now we do. And I'm uh, you know, very, very proud of, uh, of all that work. But the integration's going great. The AirTran business uh, has held up very nicely. Uh, we'll be converting uh, eight aircraft and the San Juan service. We've committed to do that uh, in uh, 2013. And then when the International is ready uh, at Southwest in 14, that's where the remainder of the aircraft will get converted uh, into Southwest Airlines along with all the employees and the airports. So with all of us that have MBAs and experience with Excel spreadsheets, it sure seems like it takes a long time to integrate. Could you talk maybe a little bit, is it culture? Is it just because it's aircraft and we just don't appreciate how many moving parts you have? Um, no, it's, it's really pretty much what I explained. I, I think it is, if it was just airplanes and just airports, um, our, the employees at AirTran are very anxious to come over to Southwest. They want the Southwest uniform on. Uh, and all of that, we could, we could actually do all of those things very quickly. Uh, but, the tech not, but we can't take the AirTran route network as it exists today with international and move it into Southwest. So that's the long pole in the tent and that's, that'll be up and running in 2014 and again, uh, it's a couple of years to do that but uh, it, it's an important strategic step forward for Southwest and at the same time it's enabling the integration of AirTran so it really is a twofer in that sense. There's nobody at Southwest that I can find that's not proud to be a Southwest employee or fly the airline or whatever it is. So what is it that you think, you, you know, this is 40 plus years that you've been able to keep the airline as, as young as the day it was started? Well, people are people. And um, I think most people will respond if they think you care about them. And I just think it's that simple. And I think if you do care, you figure out a way to address whatever issues there are. And uh, that's just, that's what we've been able to do. I don't think there's a magic formula. Uh, the world changes, and um, people like to, they, people are proud at Southwest, and they want to know why we're changing, and so we uh, put a lot of effort into uh, not just explaining to our employees what we're doing, but also in soliciting their ideas and their feedback, um, because they want to have a voice. This is their family and their company, uh, and their financial future, and they want to make sure that we're on the right track. So just understanding that the short haul business is half of what it used to be and that we have to make adjustments, 
our folks go, I get that, I understand. We've got to make some adjustments. So uh, they love what we do. They're very proud of the fact that we're number one in customer service, like Kevin said. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of pride uh, involved with that, and they work very hard to maintain that number one ranking. So is it true you really respond to 46,000 emails every morning before you come to the office? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, it's not just me, of course. I mean, it's far, far from that. I think, uh, and I've shared this many times, uh, I, I think I was most humbled in my life the first day that I was uh, asked to be CEO because you, you then quickly realize you're completely dependent upon tens of thousands of people. And uh, so it, it's not me, and it, it's our people that make this happen, uh, and our people that work together, our people that meet our, our customers' uh, needs every day. And I get a lot of customer correspondence, too. I get more customer correspondence, actually, than I get from our, our people. Uh, and nine times out of 10, what they're writing me to tell me is what a wonderful experience they had on a Southwest flight because of our people. And uh, that makes you very proud. Well, I'll tell you that not everybody will allow for there to be a customer response card somewhere. And so I appreciate that you know, you're open to that because it is a service business and it's very important to be able to hear how, from customers how you know, something went well or something you know, could be improved. Um, but talk about, we want to talk about costs for a second. At one point, you, know, you talked about price stimulating traffic and, right. and you had a great low cost advantage. Today, when we look at the numbers, um, the differential has narrowed quite a bit. How do you go back and, and widen that again so that you can stimulate traffic where you need to? Well, we're still a, uh, a low-cost carrier, and uh, that's a, a, another aspect of the pride that you were referring to with our people earlier. Uh, and I think it's very important that we know that that's who we are. That's what we were founded on in, in the 1970s is low-cost. Uh, that is our brand, that's what our customers expect from us, is a low fare, and uh, it's important that we maintain that going forward. The differential uh, between Southwest and the legacy carriers has narrowed, and primarily because of bankruptcy. Uh, the, and that is a fact that we have to live with, and we have to adjust to. Uh, and I don't know that we have fully decided for the next generation exactly how we'll, we'll deal with that if it continues. Obviously, our goal is to widen that cost advantage once again, and I think we have opportunities to do that. Uh, our cost outlook, as an example, for 2013 at Southwest is quite good. So we have a number of initiatives underway. They are primarily oriented towards modernizing our fleet that will help drive our, our unit cost at least flat, if, if not down. Um, we're already seeing signs that uh, some of our legacy competitors' costs are escalating, and perhaps uh, because of labor cost pressure, they'll escalate uh, rapidly. But in any event, uh, we want to do the best we can to control our destiny, and that'll be a, a major initiative for us beginning in 2013 is to find other opportunities to drive our costs down. Uh, and, and I think a way that uh, I would explain it is we're, we're not looking at 2013 is business as usual. It's been a long time since we've hit our return on capital. Uh, that is unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable. So uh, we have major new revenue initiatives underway as well as uh, jump-starting on some uh, major new uh, cost initiatives. You, you talk about, Gary, you talk about return on invested capital and for all of us to think about the stock, you know, that's very important and you've clearly improved it and, and you can see that's part of why the stock's up year on year. But could you talk a little bit about how you arrived at a 15% return on, a pre-tax return on capital? And we, we've used it for years. Uh, part of it is just the internal uh, communication mechanism that we've used, again, dating back to the 1980s. As long as I've been around, that, that's been our hurdle rate, if you will. Uh, and we talk about it on a pre-tax basis just because, again, that's what, that's what our employees have heard for so long. Uh, we just compare it to our cost of capital, and we want to generate uh, an acceptable return uh, given the, the amount of risk that our business uh, incurs, and 15% uh, uh, works well. We hit 15% for all of the decade of the 70s, all of the decade of the 80s, and all of the 90s. So it's the 2000s with all the pressures that we've had since 9-11 uh, that we haven't hit, but uh, this next decade, I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going we're gonna to be in the hunt for that. The I want to 
I did promise we're going to have a little bit of fun. And you know, one of the things I wanted to ask is, so how many miles have you traveled on, uh, on Southwest since um, um, you, you started with the company? It's got to be at least a million, maybe. It, it's got to be. <laughs> it's a lot. And, and do you get like a special card, you know, if you've flown a million miles or five million miles or anything like that? No, I mean, they give you a seat you want. You get to be the first in I, line. I, I get to pass out the peanuts. That's what, <laughs> that's what I've earned. And then last, you know, I, you have a famous Halloween party every year. I mean, so how do you go about thinking about that Halloween costume? I mean, because it shows up on the Internet in all sorts of places. So uh, it sets a standard, I guess, for Southwest employees. Uh, I've kind of exhausted after 27, 26 uh, Halloweens what to be. And so, yeah, we've gone to looking for ideas. Some ideas I can't repeat uh, that I get. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I tried to be Dave Barger one year, and that, that was... <laughs> nobody thought that was a good idea, but Dave. Dave thought that was good. <laughs> Dave loaned me his, uh, his Western hat. Uh, two years ago, and so I took Barger's hat and reshaped it uh, so that I could be the Woody character. And he hasn't then, gotten it back. Have no, <laughs> and because we tried to reshape it back, and it 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 really looks bad now. So <laughs> I'm going to buy you a hat. I, I promised him I would. You could give him a Texas football helmet or something like that. University of Texas. But we have great fun. It's just pure fun, and we have a great time with it every year. And uh, all the Southwest folks in the room will uh, will. Uh, tell you that they have a good time as well. Jerry, thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. It's Pleasure. A lot of fun. Thanks for having me. With, with that, we have time for one question, one or two questions out of the audience. So, uh, In the last 12 to 15 years, we've seen a horrendous downturn in interest in flying. And I'm just wondering, uh, do, do the airlines, the Southwest, see this as a threat? And if so, uh, what's your plans? That's a tough one. I, I, again, I, I keep going back to the word cost or the word price, but I think that that is a huge deterrent to uh, flying uh, as a hobby or, or for fun. We have, a, we have a great, not just a great airline, it's a great company. It's, it's a company that people want to work for. It's a company that people want to be associated with. Um, if you're a pilot, I think you want to work for an airline, and at least uh, over four decades, we've been the airline uh, to work for. Uh, our employees have been very well cared for over the years. We've never had a furlough. We've never had a, a, a layoff. We've never had a pay cut. Uh, we have industry-leading uh, compensation, not to mention, you know, just the opportunity to grow. And uh, we're building Southwest right now to be able to expand beyond the, the borders of the 48 states uh, to North America, and we're very excited about that. Uh, so we have a long list of um, employees that want to join the company, including pilots. It really is a pilot's airline, so uh, we haven't seen any, uh, any issues there. On a broader scale, to your point, yeah, I think we have to be concerned about where we're headed over the next generation in terms of attracting uh, people into the pilot ranks. I think our country is facing challenges uh, beyond that. I think, you know, just the whole, the lack of engineering students, uh, as an example, is also a concern. And obviously, we're a real high-tech, uh, heavy engineering uh, kind of an industry. So it, it's more than just pilots. But uh, uh, again, we're very fortunate at Southwest. We've got a good company. I think it's another reason why a company needs to aspire to be great because you, you're not going to be unless you can really attract good people. And obviously, we can't be an airline unless we have really good pilots. And I'm grateful that we do. Folks, let's give a round of applause. For this. We have a, before we leave, before we leave, we have a, we have a small memento, uh, Gary, on behalf of the Wings Club. won't get through TSA if you, don't, if you do that. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, on behalf of the Wings Club, why don't you sit here? Thanks. have the Wings Club, I'd like to present you a plaque uh, thanking you for coming again this year and look forward to seeing you next year. You Thanks, Thank you. Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Howard, Howard, we have a commemorative Medal of Honor coin that we'd like to provide to you and thank you for uh, today thank, very thank much. You, thank, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.